Well, good evening, church. I noticed a theme in our prelude music. First, before Joan started playing, it was sweet hour of prayer. And then you were praying, take it to the Lord in prayer, or something like that. So, amen. We need, the, we need the Lord, right? We need to talk to him. We need to go to him in prayer. Well, before we get started this evening, I want to share a couple of missionary letter uh, portions with you so that we can continue to Stay focused on missions, especially as our missions conference gets closer and closer. We're just about five weeks away from that beginning, six weeks. And be praying for the families. We'll be sharing uh, fairly soon who all will be here with us. And uh, it's going to be a, uh, a wonderful week as it normally is. Uh, two quick prayer, le prayer letters. The first one is from the Putman family in Brazil. And we're rejoicing because they are, they've been in Brazil a while. They were working under, under another missionary and they trained under them, and now they have left to go out and start their own work there in Brazil. So Victory Baptist Church had its inaugural services on April, uh, April, August 5th through the 7th, and praise the Lord, we had a wonderful kickoff. Many, many hours were put into making it a reality. We had our first Get Acquainted meeting on July 21st with nine people from the community in attendance. We didn't know what to expect, and we had new, two new contacts that we had not previously met that were in attendance. Bruno was one of them. He came by himself the first week. And as we talked with him, it became very obvious that he and his family are in great need of a good church. Please pray for Bruno and Vanessa and their three children. We're praying for an open door to be able to minister to this family. It's amazing as we talked with people and made visits, how many had mentioned to me that they were praying for a Bible preaching church in their area. While Panada has several Baptist churches, there is very little gospel outreach by the way of soul winning and discipling. Uh, uh, I think it's Pinda is the name of it. Pinda is still extremely Catholic, and we're praying for the Lord to give us open doors as we continue to spread God's word. Our first Sunday, uh, Sylvana and Fatima were lost by the church. Janata helped them with directions and then invited them to come. They came that uh, Sunday night, and that same week, we were able to visit them, and praise the Lord, they both trusted Christ as their Savior. So they were near the church, and they were lost, as in they needed directions. And so they invited them, and ultimately, they were one to the Lord. Uh, please pray for this mom and her daughter to take the next step of baptism and growth. Please pray for Alfredo and Patricia. Their oldest, Eduardo, is, is 19 and is lost and has not shown any interest at this point in hearing from God's word about his condition or his need. Please pray for the work, the Lord, uh, for the Lord to work in his heart and to give us an open door. So pray for the Putnam family ministering in Brazil, and it's exciting to see them move on to the area that God has led them to. This next letter comes from the McCourt family. They are church planning missionaries here in the U.S., in fact, in Toledo, not too far away. And I hesitated a little bit sharing this because... You know, a lot of times we get great news of how things are going from the mission field. We rejoice with what the Lord's doing in the life of our missionaries, but it's not always easy. Many times there are challenges that come, and, and so this is one of those letters where uh, our brother is begging for prayer for, from us. And so and that's the heading of the prayer letter, brethren, pray for us. Thank you for all your prayers, financial, financial support, and even hands-on help. Uh, just as a maybe reminder, we sent several thousand dollars to them within the last year or so to help with a purchase of a church building that had become available, and they needed to raise a lot of money fairly quickly, and our church was able to help with that, and we've been supporting the McCourt, the McCourt family for at least five years. It says, we truly appreciate you and all your encouragement. We have seen many ups and downs over the years. We have seen the Lord do amazing things. We're putting all of our trust and hope in him once again and ask you to pray for us. In the last few months, we have had a falling away of some members and with a large percentage of the giving. 
It started with two families working together to complain and sow discord in the congregation. They started arguments with our core leaders and one family even writing an open letter of accusation against me, which they sent to the trustees. These two families were our biggest givers by far and caused a $1,500 per month deficit in our budget when they left. One of them uh, uh, was doing all the mowing for the church with their own equipment and when they left we were forced to invest in a new mower for our four acres of grass. We lost a large chunk of our reserves in addition uh, to uh, the monthly deficit of you know, people who have moved on. Uh, we thought that was in our past. We saw the Lord provide financially over the summer with special gifts coming in as well as some wonderful surprise sources of income. We had neighborhood Bible time do our VBS this year and our people gave special offerings to cover the entire cost of the week. The men and I went out uh, door to door every, in every neighborhood around the church over 2,000 invitations with the gospel were given. Local fire department came for our water wars night and even one police officer stopped by who was saved. From only having two teens in our church, we enrolled, uh, we saw enrollment of 10 teens that week and 10 juniors as well. Two young people were saved. Praise the Lord. We followed up with the families through prayer and visitation over the next, over, this, over the preceding several weeks. We continue to see first-time guests, including a family of five, uh, five, just this past week. And then he goes on to talk about some other internal discord that was sown within the church and more families leaving, causing a even bigger deficit. So he says, as he concludes the letter, so here we are, needing a miracle. From seeing the, the Lord work amazingly to, face, to facing real bankruptcy, we have gone from the mountaintop to the valley. Our budget needs $8,200 per month just to stay afloat, and we're seeing offerings of about $6,000 per month. We have gone through our reserves and are $17,000 short of our annual need as of this month. I've been applying for side jobs to alleviate some of the financial burden, but have not had success. We don't, we don't have reserves left to cover the shortfall and are facing closing doors by the end of next month. We need the Lord. I plan to keep on going as long as possible with special prayer meetings, outreach scheduled at the city's fall festival in October, as well as a thousand gospel tracts planned for Halloween outreach. I hope and pray for a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. Will you pray for us? So we see an excited family beginning a new work, and we see a family that's been there for a number of years that are really struggling and wondering what on earth is going on with this work that God has led them to start. And so I wanted to share that one just to say and share with the church that sometimes things are difficult on the mission field, whether it's overseas or whether it's right here. And so Jim and Angela McCourt, I want you to pray for this family. And um, who knows, if the Lord were to lay on your heart in some way to help them, then uh, by all means do so, and we'll pass that on to them. But uh, this is a, a good man, a faithful man that's been doing a good work there. And... Um, Nothing's too hard for the Lord. No amount of money's too big for him. So let's pray, and then uh, we'll continue on with our service. Father, thank you for the chance to gather here this evening. We do want to lift up our pastor and Randy and Kelly and Sister Sandy as they're ministering uh, across the globe, uh, on the other side of the, the globe, in India. Father, their day is complete. They're probably and hopefully sound asleep preparing for uh, their Thursday. And so, Lord, bless them, give them power as they, as they preach, as they speak and teach, as they have opportunities to minister, keep them safe from any evil that would want to uh, derail the work there, keep them free from sickness, and we know Sandy's already dealt with that to some degree. So, Lord, just bless them, help them to be a light and to accomplish your purpose for taking them there. We rejoice with this uh, family in Brazil, the Putnam family, that have begun this new work in an area that is in need of the gospel. Lord, continue to bless them, keep their zeal uh, at a high level of intensity as they uh, meet so many new people that have a desperate need for the gospel. May you equip them to speak your truth, and may we see and hear future reports of many that, that come to know you as Savior. And then, Lord, we, th we pray for Jim and Angela McCourt. We're, we're thankful for the miracles they've already seen in, in the work that they started there a number of years back, how you've given them a property when it seemed impossible. And now they find themselves in a, in a situation where they're concerned about keeping the doors open because of loss of income and loss of some families. So Lord, bring healing to that church. I know they're reeling, being a young church, from losing key members and disunity that has been there. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, keep the enemy at bay. 
Oftentimes, the enemy gets in there and wants to sow discord and, and try to, to break up what, what uh, you are doing there, Lord. So keep their, help them to keep their eyes on you, to keep their faith and their trust in you, uh, to, to do the work that you're leading them to do, and to uh, hopefully be able to, to experience a great miracle that can only be explained by the power of Almighty God. And, and Lord, we'll be able to rejoice with them. But Lord, as, as that area, Toledo, Ohio, or Jim and Angela come to our minds, may we continually lift them up in that church, Living Word Baptist Church, and do a great work that uh, we can praise you and glorify you about. Uh, Father, um, this is your work. It's not theirs. It's your church. It's, it's not theirs. It's not ours. And so, Father, uh, defend that which uh, belongs to you and provide uh, for that work which belongs to you, that the cause of Christ may be advanced in Toledo and beyond throughout the world. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing on this service now. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. If you would stand, Brother Jim's going to come and lead us in our great hymns of the faith tonight. Hymn 329, The Cleansing Wave. <clears throat> oh, now I see the crimson wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge in, oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I see the new creation rise, I hear the speaking blood. It speaks polluted, nature dies, sinks neath the cleansing flood. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I rise to walk in heaven's own light above the world and sin with heart made pure and garments white and Christ enthroned within the cleansing stream I see I see I plunge and oh it cleanseth me oh praise the Lord it cleanseth me it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amazing grace, tis heaven below, to feel the blood applied. And Jesus only, Jesus know, my Jesus crucified. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Thank you. you may be seated. Now we're going to sing hymn number 50, Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. 
There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Now we're going to sing through one time hymn 99, Isn't He Wonderful? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Joan. Isn't he wonderful? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I mentioned uh, on Sunday, or maybe even last week, I was going to do a two-part series on a biblical response to anxiety. So tonight is going to be part one, and we're going to look at part two, obviously next Wednesday. Tonight is going to be much more looking at uh, some biblical principles about uh, biblical truths that we need to understand that help us in uh, the moments of anxiety that we all struggle with and deal with from time to time. We'll look at what does anxiety tell us about ourselves. Is anxiety always sinful? Um, and then next week, we're going to look at a more practical aspect of it. What, are, what specifically can we do to battle anxiety when it begins to take root in our lives? How can we respond in a way that is according to the Word of God and uh, pleasing to the Lord? And then also helpful for us not to fall into that trap of keep working in our minds, that same issue over and over and over, just like a spin cycle in the washing machine. It just keeps going around. So the Bible has a lot to say about this topic, and we're going to look at a lot of what the Bible has to say about that. But before we get started in our scripture and our passage, I have a short little video that I want to watch. This is a humorous video about one counselor's approach to dealing with things like fear and anxiety and worry. And I'll have some commentary about it shortly after. So go ahead and play that, Dave. Maybe. <laughs> the best approach to anxiety is just to get quiet, <laughs> just contemplate, focus on the Lord. Oh, the lights are coming back on. That must mean. It didn't play. And so it's a no-go. Looking up in the sound room. All right, thumbs down, no-go. Oh, well. So I'll, uh, I'll explain it. Many of you probably have seen this. It's, it's, a, it's made its way around the Internet. It stars Tim Conway. I remember Tim Conway. And Tim Conway has a young lady that comes to his office, and uh, she has a problem. And the problem is she has a fear of being buried alive in a box. And so Tim Conway, uh, it's not Tim Conway, it's Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart. Tim Conway's another funny guy. And so Bob Newhart says, well, you know, I've got a pretty simple approach. I, I charge five minutes for the first five minutes of counseling. And after that five minutes, it's free. And um, he said, but most people, I find that we're able to, to address their issue in, in five minutes. And, and uh, we'll go from there. So he asks this woman, he looks at his watch, and he says, go. And she says, okay, go what? What do you want me to do? He said, well, tell me about your problem. She said, well, I've, I've got this fear of being buried alive in a box. And uh, he said, buried alive in a box? 
And she says, yes, I, I'm afraid to go in tunnels. I'm afraid to uh, be in a house. I'm afraid to uh, you know, be any sort of thing that's boxy, and, you know, where I feel trapped. And he says, so uh, what you're telling me is that you have claustrophobia. And she says, well, I, I guess that's probably the case. He said, okay, and he said, I'll, I'll tell you what it is that you need to do to solve this problem. And, he, and she begins to take out a pad and a, and, a, and a pen, and he says, well, I, I really don't think you'll need to write this down because it's two words. I'll give you two words, and uh, this is what you're going to, I find most people can remember this, so this is what's going to help you. And he says, okay, you ready? And he says, stop it. Stop it. And she looks at him, stop it? You mean I'm just supposed to stop it? What do you mean by that? And he kind of laughs. He said, well, most people kind of say, have that response of all the time that I, that I talk with people. And said, yes, stop it. Um, you don't want to be you know, always worried about being buried alive in a box. Has anyone ever tried to bury you alive in a box? And she said, no, but the thought of it frightens me. And he said, well, stop it. And uh, he said, well, it's been three minutes, so I guess we're done. And he said, it'll be $5. And, and um, no, she said, I, I guess I'd like to use the rest of the two minutes. So she wanted to, he wanted to say, well, are there any other things that you struggle with? And she said, well, I'm bulimic. And he says, stop it. And then she said, well, I've got uh, a history of having destructive relationships with men. And he says, well, stop it. And, uh, and she's getting obviously pretty flustered by all this. And she says, well, I like to wash my hands a lot. And uh, Bob Newhart says, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I wash my hands all the time anyway. So, yeah, no, no problem there. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he goes on and finally, you know, she's just so frustrated that he, his response to everything is stop it. And she said, I, I, think this, I think you're being cruel to me. I don't think you're being kind, and, and I'm frustrated with this. And he says, well, let me, all right, let me back up. I'll give you 10 words, and this is what you need to do. You may want to get your pad of paper out, and you may want to write this down, but 10 words tell you exactly what you need to do. And so she pulls out her paper. She starts getting ready to write this down. And he said, stop it, or I'll bury you alive in a box. <laughs> and that's the end of the little skit. Look it up. You know, it's easy to find on Google. Bob Newhart, stop it. You know, a lot of people have that mentality, not just about things like anxiety or worry or fear. It's just stop it. You've got an addiction, stop it. Uh, you've got some other struggle uh, in your life, uh, some problem maybe with lust, you know, just stop it. Uh, is that sufficient? Is that a, a legitimate approach to solving problems that enter into our lives? And most of us, because we chuckle and, and we realize how absurd it is just to you know, be shouted out by a therapist to say, stop it. Uh, that is, you know, I guess it's kind of like, I probably remember a couple decades ago, there was a song that kind of had a very similar philosophy. It was very popular at the time. It said, don't worry, be happy. Yeah, that's how you deal with all your problems. Don't worry, be happy. Again, that's kind of the same idea of just stop it. Well, from a biblical standpoint, that's not how we deal with problems. It's never enough just to stop doing something. Now, that can be part of it. There are certain things that we allow into our lives that are not healthy, and we do need to stop it. But if that's all we do, then we will never have victory over that area. The Bible always talks about an idea of replacement. If you want to change biblically, it's always going to be put off the old man, put on the new man. Put off, and Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this a lot, and and, and makes it very clear, but, you know, put this off and put this on. Stop doing this and start doing that. And so we'll look at, we'll look at that in more details as we go forward uh, through these two weeks of looking at this biblical response to anxiety. But open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. This is going to be the primary passage that we're going to spend time with tonight as well as next week. And there's quite a few other passages that we will also look at. But Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. The Bible says, Therefore, my, brother, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Herodias and beseech uh, Sintichi that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke, yoke fellow, 
Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, what sort of things are pure, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye also were careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in what sort of state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word tonight and be challenged by it, to be instructed by it, to be convicted by it, to be helped by it. And so, Father, speak to us now. There's not a single one of us in this room that don't have things that, that at times cause us some degree of anxiety, some degree of worry. Let your word, your word here says, be careful for nothing. And so, Father, help us to understand what it is we're to do with those cares that do enter into our lives that we can respond and handle them in a way that's pleasing to you, in a way that's not sinful, in a way that's not destructive, but in a way that is productive. And so, Father, speak to us tonight, every one of us, whether listening through the internet or here in this auditorium or watching this later sometime. Father, help us to be so desirous, so passionate about wanting to please you with how we live out this Christian life you've called us to live. So, Father, be with us tonight. Help us. Help the Master Club workers as that's kicking off tonight. And there's a lot of excited kids in the building and a lot of workers excited to be back in this. Lord, all throughout this building, uh, your word is being shared and, and, and kids and youth are being challenged. Again, may you be glorified. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing now on the remainder of this service now in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, we all know Philippians 4.6 is in the Bible. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Um, we think, is that command really possible? I mean, to paraphrase that, it says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be full of care about anything. Be careful for nothing. It's kind of like the Sunday school verse that we had on Sunday morning, if you're in adult class, in James. We started a new series in James, and and James uh, chapter 1, verse 2 says, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And part of us wants to say, really? I mean, I've had some pretty severe trials. I've had some pretty severe difficulties. I've had a lot of things that are, 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 are so heavy and so difficult. And yet God's word says, don't be anxious. Is this really even possible? Can I really not worry or be anxious about anything? It just doesn't seem realistic. And so, as I made reference to, the, the truth of the matter is that all of us have experienced, to some degree, this idea of anxiety or worry. I'd be lying if I didn't say sometimes, even when I get ready to step into this pulpit, I don't feel this twinge in my stomach of anxiety and nervousness about that. And I have to remind myself, hey, this is family. You guys are, are my family. I'm never nervous in front of my family, right? I love my family. I know my family loves me, and that helps to calm my nerves in this, but uh, I think back in my life, and there's times where I've, I've struggled with uh, anxiety, and even to the point where I think it's crossed over into sin. Uh, many of you know that for the first 10 years of my time on staff here at Columbia Road, I was out in the little prayer chapel. That was my office for 10 years. That little building that some of you say, what on earth is that? Well, it used to be the world head headquarters of Harvest Baptist Missions. And actually, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty nice little uh, spot out there. Uh, if you liked fewer interruptions, I mean, someone stopping by had to actually make intentional effort to stop by there and see me. 
But there were times in that first probably 20 years of my ministry here where our, our primary financial support as a family came through Harvest Baptist Missions. And so it came through our church, but it largely came through other churches that were supporting our family and supporting that ministry. And I can say now that we never really were adequately supported. It's hard to raise financial support for an administrative organization. I'm sure Pastor Jenkins has found that out to some degree with Nehemiah's network. It's challenging. If you're not planning a church somewhere, that it's easy for people to grab a hold of that concept, but are kind of behind the scenes much more difficult. So there were times when, when, and every one of us can probably relate to this, where the month runs out before, or the money runs out before the month runs out sort of thing. And as, as one who was depending on support, support was always very, uh, it would fluctuate. And uh, there were times it was just really difficult. And I'd find myself coming at the end of the month, doing reports and looking at what the deposit was gonna be. And it's just, it wasn't adding up, it wasn't good. And I was, you've heard, many of you have heard me say this. It's like I, I was sitting up on the shore of Lake Erie and this massive wave was starting to come. And I felt it was just going to totally overtake me and just, you know, just cover me. And there's a wave of fear about, you know, how's this going to work out now? There's not enough money to care for all the bills I know need to be paid and that sort of thing. And, and, um, and so that fear would start to overtake me. And I would think, you know, Lord, what are you going to do? And it's as if the Holy Spirit would show up, and he did this every time. And um, it's like, Steve... Didn't I take care of you last month? You had a similar experience last month. Didn't I take, take, take care of you then? Didn't I take care of you last year or the year before or the year before that? And it just the Lord would remind me how much he had cared for us. We had never been in want. We had never missed a payment on anything. We had never been, not been able to purchase the food that we needed and, and so forth and so on. God always showed up and God always took care of us. And he would just remind me with that truth. And that peace that is made reference to in Philippians 4 would just, that big wave would just dissipate. And you've been up to Lake Erie where there's not a single wave on the water at all and how peaceful and calm that is. And uh, again, so I've experienced that. Sometimes we think, are my kids going to turn out all right? You know, parenting is such a challenge. And there's so many variables at play. And so sometimes we get anxious about, are my kids going to turn out okay? Are they going to choose to serve the Lord when they're out of our house and uh, making their own decisions. And, and sometimes we, we get to thinking about that. And before long, we, f- we find ourselves doing all the what ifs and, and our minds begin to spin. Uh, will they marry good spouses? I think of Abby, you know, two, my two oldest are now married and do have good spouses, but Abby doesn't have a, a man in her life. What, or, what will her husband be like? Will he lead the family? Uh, and be a strong spiritual leader in the family? Will he lead her to to grow in likeness to Christ? What if he doesn't do these things? And so sometimes we think about that. You know, how are are our kids going to turn out? Uh, And and that brings anxiety. We begin to worry about all these what ifs. What ifs lead to a lot of anxiety. Again, if we're honest, we all have some of these anxious thoughts that lurk in our thinking. Uh, again, just look at some of the recent history, or maybe even things we're going through now. Uh, interest rates skyrocketing, inflation happening, causing mortgage payments to go up, causing grocery prices to go up, causing gas prices to go up, and, and on and on it goes. COVID is linking out there. And then we, you know, as a church, we're always praying for folks with cancer, and, and um, am I going to get Alzheimer's? And so the reality is death is certain, and so we wonder, when, that's, when is that going to happen to us? And... Uh, is it going to be sooner or is it going to be later? Is it going to be painful? You know, what are the circumstances going to be? What's, how, are, how, my fam- how will my family be cared for? How are my children be cared for? All these things, again, can begin to, to take over and cause anxiety and worry. Relationship struggles. Every one of us probably could name at least one relationship that we have that's strained, that is difficult, where there's, where there's a wall or a barrier between us and it... it it breaks your heart and you're wanting that to go away and you're wanting that to be reconciled and that causes us to worry. Relationships are challenging, they're difficult. And then oftentimes, made reference to this already, but oftentimes they're just seemingly never enough, never enough resources, 
never enough time, never enough finances, and uh, again, we can all relate to that. All those things can make us full of care. And so anxiety affects everyone. No one escapes from it. In this worrisome, broken, sinful world that we find ourselves living in, we feel anxious sometimes. And so the problem of worry and obsessing about our problems and what ifs is universal. That's one of the reasons why the Lord said in 1 Peter 5, 7, look at that real quick. Some of you could probably quote that verse from memory. It's a great verse to learn and memorize. First, or Philippians 4, verse 6 says, be careful for nothing. So again, don't worry about, don't be anxious about anything. Yet 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And uh, so even here, there's an acknowledgement that yes, there are times when cares will enter into our life, but the challenge is God doesn't expect us to hold on to these or to bear this ourselves. We cast those upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. I mean, just let that simple statement resonate within your heart. When you think of the things that may cause you worry and anxiety that are going on in your life right now, do you believe that God cares for you? Do you really believe that? He cares for you. He knows. He knows the nth detail even better than we know. He knows the future. He knows what's going to happen. So, be careful for nothing, but then yet 1 Peter 5, 7 acknowledges that their cares do enter into our lives. So we cast those cares upon him, for he careth for you. If we didn't have any cares, we wouldn't need to cast them upon our Savior. John 16, 33 says it this way. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye might have peace in the world. Ye shall have tribulation. We know that, right? We experience that. Sometimes we wish we could cross that out, but that's the reality. In the world... You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Praise God for that. And then Job 14.1, man that is born of woman is of a few days full of trouble. Again, we know that from experience. Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Our capacity to feel concern about the trouble is actually, if you think about this, our capacity to feel concern about the trouble that enter into our life is, is essentially a gift of God. If we are so in, intensely concerned that we know something's wrong, we know something needs to be done. So anxiety can serve a useful function in our lives when it alerts us and drives us to bring those troubles, to bring those cares to the Lord. But unfortunately, anxiety itself also tends to become part of the problem. All the stress and worry causes us to physically feel bad, to feel sick, to have headaches, migraine headaches, physical body pain, to be incapacitated, unable to get out of bed because of all the worries, unable to focus among many other challenging things. And so again, we all can probably relate to that and know how quickly anxiety, not just the problem itself, but even the physical manifestation of it in our bodies can cause things to go off the rails. So if we all experience worry and anxiety to some degree. And we're commanded to be careful for nothing, as it says here in Philippians 4, 6. The question is, is all anxiety then sinful? And if not, when does it become sinful? So worry is typically motivated by fear. Fear is the feeling of anxiety caused either by a real or a perceived presence of danger, of evil, of pain or consequence. So fear is a God-given emotion that he gave it to us to help us. Uh, recently, on this past Thursday, we took our neighbors, uh, our lost neighbors that we're trying to build a relationship with uh, out to dinner and to the zoo. And again, our intent is to build this relationship so we can, they, we can get to know them better and ultimately lead them to the Lord. Well, we took them to the zoo because there's a big festival going on called the Asian Lantern Festival. Anybody been to that? It's phenomenal. Wonderful night. Worth whatever you pay to go to it. Just, it's, it's excellent. But one of the things that was really neat that night, other than just the spectacle of all the, the beautiful lights, right about dusk, we were over by the wolf exhibit. 
And one of the wolves came out of, we were looking for him, we couldn't see any of them, and all of a sudden one of them came out of the, the woods and he got up on this rock, his front paws up on the rock, and he stretched out and he started to let out these howls that, you know, wolves do. And it was just majestic to hear that. And I had been there numerous times. I'd never seen that before. And it was just really the neatest thing. Well, Monday morning, I turn on the news at breakfast and I hear one of the wolves at the Cleveland Zoo got out of its pen and got into the zoo. And they had to gather up all of the, you know, all of the patrons that were there and lock them into a building until they could finally track this wolf down, tranquilize it and, you know, get it back where it needs to be. And uh, I thought, can you imagine being there at the zoo and you know a wolf is on the loose? Now, we don't know a whole lot about wolves because they're not really in Ohio's wildlife, but they are killing machines. They are so dangerous. They can bring down grizzly bears. They can bring down elk. I mean, animals that are five and ten times their size. And uh, that probably wouldn't have happened at the Cleveland Zoo. I mean, I, he was probably more afraid of all of the, the people, but still, if you were there and you heard a wolf was on the loose or a tiger or an elephant, that natural fear, that God-given fear would set in and say, I need to find shelter. I need to get to a place of safety. And so I thought that was really interesting. It took me back to, again, I've shared this in the past before. Uh, my oldest son, Tyler, as many of you know, is a big hunter. He loves to hunt. He lived out in New Mexico for six years, and I had the privilege of going on an elk hunt twice with him in southern New Mexico way up in the mountains at about 10,000 feet, way off the grid, no internet, I mean, no, no cell signal, no nothing. And uh, you're out there and you're alone and there's no other humans around for maybe miles. And all of a sudden it becomes very apparent that you are no longer at the top of the food chain. That although you are hunting, we were hunting elk, that you have to be so aware of your surroundings because you may also be being hunted at the very same time. And it's been known to happen out there, mountain lions and bears and so forth. And I remember sleeping in our tent and my son, it was me and my son Tyler the first time, he was sound asleep and I'm hearing all these twigs break right outside the tent. And uh, I mean, there were free range cattle all over the place, which I thought was so odd, you know, 10,000 feet, they're just cattle walking around. Uh, there were bears, there were elk, there were deer, there were mountain lion, and I don't know what is outside my tent. And um, you have to go to the bathroom too. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to leave this tent. There's no way I'm going out there. But I remember my heart was beating. This, it, I never remember ever beating as hard and as fast that, I mean, I thought it was just going to come right out of my chest. And I was afraid. I mean, I was fearful because I thought something, I mean, it's just a little piece of nylon. Any, any bear could come through that in a, in a heartbeat and that'd be the end of it. And we don't have a phone, we can't call anybody. I mean, it's just, and so God has given us that idea of fear causing us an emotion to take our problems to either flee, to get away from danger or to take our problems to the Lord. So think about, it. is it wrong for a devoted mother who has a teenager that just got their driver's license, that maybe is out for the first time at night with friends to keep a watchful eye at the window until that child safely arrives home. And obviously the implication is I'm worried about my child, that they'll make wise decisions, that I, you know, everyone is looking at their phones when they're driving anymore and driving is a, is a very challenging and dangerous thing. And, and so there's concern there, or maybe a concerned father who has just heard, and Chris was telling me a story about someone else that she, a friend today that she was talking to who husband had just lost her job, but a concerned father who knows that he's losing his job and uh, he's fearful about how am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to make all these ends meet? Uh, who hasn't dealt with similar feelings like that? And so those feelings are not wrong or necessarily sinful. Anxiety can serve a useful function in our lives when it alerts us to trouble and it drives us to bring those troubles to the Lord, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So problems do arise, but when they become worrisome thoughts that are all-consuming and cause us to respond sinfully, then it does become sinful. So at what point does anxiety become sinful? When our worry and anxiety cause us to be consumed with our circumstances. Consume, meaning it dominates our thoughts. 
as well as our actions. I made reference to some of the things that sometimes happens physically when we start to struggle with our anxiety. Um, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to engage in our responsibilities and caring for those things. Uh, that's when we've crossed over into uh, a natural God-given worry or fear about something and, and we're no longer taking to the Lord and leaving it there with Him. We're trying to control it or figure it out for ourselves and we cross that line in, into it becoming sinful. So much so that it controls us, causes us to ne neglect relationships, neglect responsibilities. When it harms our bodies, upset stomachs that lead to, to ulcers, to migraine headaches, etc. When it causes us to lose hope instead of finding biblical answers. When we, in essence, forget God or turn away from God or flee from God. When we stop functioning is a sign that it's become sinful. Again, not getting out of bed, not going to work, not engaging in our responsibilities. And so there is a point when our anxiety that God has given us, that natural fear, can become sinful. And that should greatly concern us because we don't want to sin against our Lord. We don't want to um, not trust in him uh, by not just what we say, but how we uh, conduct ourselves, the actions that we have. The other thing that is, I think, helpful for us to look at as we're kind of laying all this, this foundation, what, is our anxiety, what does our anxiety reveal about us? What does it, what's it say about what's going on in our hearts? And so when anxiety misfires, when we overreact or when we react improperly to real trouble, when we become upset about things that ought not to trouble us, when we get so caught up in all the what ifs. Have you ever, ever found yourself there? You know, what if this happens and what if this happens and what if this happens and it just keeps to going on and snowballing and getting worse and worse and worse. In both those cases, our anxiety reveals what's really going on in our heart. So in every situation where we start to feel sinfully anxious, we believe something's threatening our world. Uh, we feel like things are out of control, that we're afraid that something bad might happen. And so you're trying to control your world and keep those bad things from taking place. And so imagine, imagine you're facing real trouble. Imagine, God forbid, your child is diagnosed with a progressive incurable disease. You don't want your child to be ill. Uh, you want them to live a long, happy, productive, well-rounded life. You should be concerned. I mean, obviously we're going to be concerned in a situation like that. But what do you do with that concern? Do you lean on an ever-deepening dependence on Almighty God in a situation like that? Or do you erase God from the picture, become full of fear, full of worry, grumbling, Bitter, bitter, even angry at God. How could you have allowed this to happen? Now picture yourself in a situation where there isn't really any real trouble. Uh, but you're still anxious. And I can relate to this because I'm an introvert. And uh, whereas my wife loves being around a group of people, I would much rather kind of get off on the fringe and uh, get away from the crowd. But let's say you're going to a party and you don't know anyone. That's enough to send an introvert into a panic attack right there. Uh, you don't want to be excluded. You don't want to be ignored. You don't want to be rejected. But what is it that you do want? You want approval. You want to be part of the crowd. You want to matter. You want to be noticed. You want someone to, to come up and talk with you, perhaps. You shouldn't be concerned, but you are. So how do you deal with that? Again, is that an improper, what does that reveal about what's going on in our heart? How you deal with your anxiety in both of these situations, whether it's the ill child or this uh, fake party that we're talking about here, reveals what's going on in our hearts. How do you respond when you don't get what you want? How do you respond when you don't get what you want or when you get what you don't want? Are you full of fear, anxiety, worry? Do you have trouble sleeping? Do you become obsessed with your problem? Does your mind just keep rolling it over and over and over again and you can't seem to stop it? All those responses give us a window into our heart and they show us that we're responding to the troubles of this world uh, without having proper faith and trust in God. 
We want to respond to the troubles that this world is going to throw us with faith and trust in Almighty God. Living in a troubled, sinful world, we will always be tempted to lose sight of God. And if we do this, we attempt to control our, the, our world on our own. And again, all these things set in that we know aren't pleasing to the Lord. So what are we to do? How do we respond in faith to situations like this? How do we put our complete trust in God? So I want to look at a number of things from this passage. And again, this week, I'm going to look at some truths that I want us to remember. And next week, we're going to look at this in a very much more, a very much more practical manner of very specific things that we can do to have victory over this. So here's the first thing that I want us to remember. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 5. The Bible says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Here's the first thing that we need to remember, especially when the trouble of this world begins to set in and we start to feel our stomach starting to turn and we're feeling those, those feelings of worry and anxiety and fear. We need to remember that the Lord is near. The Lord is near. I recently shared with someone especially when we find ourselves going through difficult times like this. Remember what you believe. Remember your theology. Remember what you believe. The reality is the Lord is near. Paul, as he's writing this letter to the Philippians, he's getting ready to say, you know, be careful for nothing. He reminds them, hey, the Lord is at hand. He is near. And again, that simple truth needs to resonate with us. We're not in this by ourselves. We are not alone. The Lord is at hand. Uh, going back to our Genesis study that uh, we looked at the life of Joseph in a number of uh, messages earlier this year. And a, a couple of them, the messages that I covered just really challenged me. These were not new thoughts, but I just, I love what, I, what the Bible says about Joseph. Joseph 39, chapter 39, verse 2. Uh, if anyone had a reason to be anxious and full of worry and full of fear, it was Joseph. I mean, his family rejected him. They wanted to kill him. They put him in a pit. Uh, they told his father he was dead. They sold him to, uh, as, as a slave. He was carried down into Egypt. He was uh, sold as a slave in Potiphar's house. Again, all these things started to happen. He was falsely accused, put in prison. I mean, just the worst of the worst happened to him. And yet in, in Genesis 39, verse 2, it says, And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. In spite of everything he was going through, the Lord was with him. In verse 21, same chapter, the Bible says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Verse 23, The keeper of the prison looked not to any that, anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. Speaking of Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph. We're never alone. When it feels like we're being overwhelmed with that wave that's coming over us of fear, and the enemy saying, how's your God going to help you now? How is he going to get you through this situation? As believers, we remember what we know to be true. And what we know to be true is that the Lord is near. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in, in truth. So the Lord is near. And again, that sounds like a simple thing. But most of the things that I'm going to remind you about here tonight and tomorrow night are not earth-shattering. Uh, they're very simple, and we know them, but we in the moment have to choose to believe and then step out by faith on what we know to be true. The pain and the fear and the worry are very real, and it seems like it's all going to overtake me, but I choose to believe that God is a loving God, a God that is a caring God. He careth for you. He's going to help me through these situations. So I am choosing by faith to trust in him and his goodness and his character in the midst of my anxiety. And that begins with acknowledging that the Lord is near. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're never alone. We never have to face life's troubles alone. The Lord is near. Secondly, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The second thing that we need to remember is that the Lord is listening. 
He's listening. Paul is challenging us. He says, be careful for nothing. So go to him. If anxiety in, in your life is full of care, or you're struggling with this, go to him. And everything, and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He wants to hear from us. We go to him because he is near and because he is listening. I love Psalm 62. Uh, Psalm 62 and verse 6. This is such a great a psalm that has brought such comfort to me over the years. Again, for someone who is full of worry and care and anxiety, the Bible says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. The Lord is near. We are never alone. God wants to hear from us. He is listening for us. He says, hey, pour out your heart before me. I am a refuge. You can come to me. I am a place of safety. I'm your rock. I'm your salvation. I'm your defense. I will not be moved. You may feel this is going to overtake you and you don't see the way out, but hey, I will not be moved. Trust in me. Remember what you believe. The Lord is near. The Lord is listening. I love Jeremiah 33, 3. We call this verse God's phone number. Jeremiah 33, 3. Again, another verse worth memorizing. The weeping prophet says, call unto me. And I'll answer thee. This is God speaking through Jeremiah. Call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God's phone number, Jeremiah 33. God is listening. Call unto him. Pour your heart out before him. He'll show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God's at work here. When it seems, again, like it's going to overtake us, God has a plan. God is in control. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that he'll bring you through this? Do you believe that he'll be there with you in the midst of it? So the Lord is near, and the Lord is listening. Thirdly, remember that the Lord is guarding you with peace. The Lord is guarding you with peace. Verse 7 of Philippians 4 says, We go to him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request may be known unto God. And as we do that, verse 7 says, In the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that what, you, what we all want in the midst of our anxiety and our worry and our stress and our fear? We want peace. We want all of those turbulent waters just to, to calm down. God promises peace, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then at the end of verse 9, Paul says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Not only is God with us, God is nearby and at close at hand, he says the God of peace will be with us in the midst of our turbulence, in the midst of our anxiety. So remember that the Lord is guarding you with peace. And then finally, these truths bring contentment. These three truths bring contentment. Look at verse, beginning in verse 11. The Bible says, Not that I, res I speak in respect of want or need, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's a verse that probably the vast majority of, of us in this auditorium tonight could, could quote by heart. But did you ever connect that the context of I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, is in the context of anxiety and worry and being content with what God has given us and our, our circumstances. And again, knowing that we can trust God to, to be with us, to hear our prayers, to give us peace 
in the midst of all of that. So again, what a great promise. And notice, again, just a few things that really jump out at me. And we're going to even break these verses down in some more detail next week because there's a lot of little nuggets here that can help us practically as we deal with with our, our fear, our anxiety, our worries. But notice Paul says here, he says, For I have learned in what service state I am therewith to be content. In the midst of your anxiety, have you ever prayed for contentment? I mean, we're praying oftentimes for, Lord, take this away. Make this go away. Make the waters peaceful again. You take all this turbulence away. Calm my heart. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, which includes saying, Lord, teach me what it is you're trying to teach me through this. Help me to learn to be content. That is a kind of a lost word in our society today. We're not content with anything. We need more, bigger, better. And those of us who have walked the path sometime realize that uh, that never satisfies, that doesn't bring contentment. If, if something external is always our objective to try and bring peace and happiness and contentment. It's always the Lord. The Lord, because he is with us, because he is near, because he is the God of peace and he will give us peace, allows us to be content because we know he's in control. He knows, we, we know he's our Lord. We know he is our Savior. So it's not enough just to say, stop it. It's not enough. It's not enough just to say, don't worry, be happy. All your problems are going to go away. If we ever want to change biblically, we're going to have to embrace this idea of replacement. Um, that's something that all of us have to, as we grow in Christ-likeness, work on uh, stopping doing certain things, putting things off, putting things on. Our actions, our thoughts, our motives, but we need to replace those things with good, God-honoring, God-trusting thoughts, actions, and motives. And we're going to look at those in some more detail next week. So let's pray. I want to have a discussion about some of these things because there's some things I think we can learn from each other here. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather here tonight to open your word and to be challenged with these just simple truths that in the midst of our anxiety that we need to grab a hold of tonight. So Lord, help us truly to remember what it is that we believe, that we can stand on these by faith in the midst of how, however difficult the problem is, full of trouble, but the word of God says. We live in a fallen world, a sinful world, an enemy that, I think of this brother in, in Toledo that is really going through it with this church. I imagine the worry and the anxiety and the fear, we're going to have to shut the doors at the end of October because the money is going to be all gone. Lord, give him your peace. Give him your strength. Help him to trust in you, to know that you're in control, that you have a purpose. Lord, help us to do the same as well. Thank you for giving us emotions that, that warn us of things that maybe we need to flee from or that uh, remind us that in the midst of our fear, we have a God that we can run to and cast all our cares upon you. So Lord, help us this evening. Help us to be um, ones who are not only hearers of the word of God, but doers, as we see in this passage as well, that we'll speak of even more next week. Doers of these things, Lord. Put them in, into practice by faith, trusting in the good God that we serve. Father, we love you. Help us this evening uh, to live out your word in this area of anxiety, to be careful for nothing. We ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. So let me ask you, have you ever tried the stop it method or the don't worry, be happy method? Anybody ever try that? Want to say how it worked for you? No? You guys are all smarter than me? David? Yeah, that's, you know, that's, part of the, that's part of the solution we'll, we'll look at next week. Because the, the Philippians is very clear here. Paul says, when we're consumed with being careful about, full of care, and we go to the Lord in prayer, and we leave those things with him, and when the God of peace comes, then he says, in verse 8, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, honest, just, pure, Lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So we change what we're thinking about. And so we'll talk very specifically about how we apply that next week. But yes, we, we can't keep dwelling on that which is causing us this anxiety 
in fear because if we keep saying, I'll, just, I'll stop thinking, I just need to stop thinking about that, I'm not going to think about it anymore, that's all we'll think about. So we consciously move our thinking to something else, that which is true, honest, just, pure, pure, lovely, of good report. At the most basic level, those words describe who? Jesus Christ. So at the most basic level, thank on Jesus, run to him. And there's even more practical ways we'll unpack that next week. David, you got something else you were going to say? Amen. Bill, you've told me before, when you hear an alcoholic say these words, you know they're in trouble. I got this. Yeah, I got this. That's very similar to just stop it, don't worry, be happy. I got this. Do you see the fallacy of, of that type of thinking there? How dangerous that is? If you're a person of action, and there are some, I mean, you can look around, you know who always got to be moving, always got to be doing something. If you're not careful, you get into that philosophy, I can do this. You know, I just, I got to start working at it. I got to just engage in this process. And we do. The Lord's just not going to sit back and throw a magic wand and all of a sudden things are, all the anxiety is going to be gone. We do have to engage. We have to step up by faith and operate on these promises. Lord, I know you're near. I know you want to hear my prayer, so I'm coming to you in prayer. I know you'll give me peace, so I'm expecting you to give me that peace. And Lord, I can be content. I can do all things through Christ with strength and made. But we acknowledge that it's not of us, that I am not strong enough to do this, that I can't do enough to, to chase this stuff away, that Lord, it's all of you, but I'm going to engage in what you're leading me to do. Or I'm going to step out by faith on your word because I know it's true. Um, how have these truths, the Lord is near, the Lord is listening, the Lord is guarding you with his peace, helped you overcome anxiety? Anyone have a testimony about just these simple truths of the word of God, how they've helped you successfully, victoriously, in a God-pleasing way, deal with anxiety that has entered into your life in the past? Lori. Yeah, I remember that. Anybody else? How, how are these truths helped you victoriously deal with anxiety in the past? As a testimony to what God does and can do. Jim. Amen. 
Amen. Yeah, that's good. Very good. We need go-to verses like that. Because that, it may not be today that we're struggling with something, but you know it's coming. There's going to be some major issue that uh, some un, you know, out of the blue diagnosis or some major uh, accident or, or something like that. And we need to know ahead of time what we're going to go to to find strength and help to remind us that, hey, God is near. God's holding my hand. You know, the God says, the Bible says, no man shall ever pluck me out of his hand. I mean, he's got a firm grip on us. And those things give great hope in the midst of that. Anybody else? Um, I was going to ask, I guess similar, the third question I had is what scripture passages, verses, truths have been go-to verses to help you find victory over anxiety and, um, again, live in a way that you know is pleasing to the Lord. Jim? just like him. It's just like him. Psalm 56, 3 says, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Again, that's a choice we're making, Joan. Lynn. Amen. Excellent. Anybody else? Something that may help someone else here tonight. Maybe they need to hear what verse you have to say. Bill. My mom always uh, went back to uh, Psalm 23 1. So I knew you the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And everything after that is just emphasizing it. And you know, just to remember your name, but we would continue to be and our shepherd does everything for us. Amen. Well, you have a homework assignment. Homework assignment is to read Philippians uh, 4 1 through 13 again. Read it slowly. Meditate on it, chew it up this, this coming week, because we're going to tackle that again in some more detail next week. And then I'd also challenge you to, to read Matthew chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 25 through verse 33. So Matthew 6, 25 through 33, that's the passage that begins, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or yet for your body, what you should put on. Is not your life more than meat, your body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you, are you not much better than they? So read that passage, and again, meditate on it. And here's the assignment within that passage. I want you to do some bird watching this week. Anybody like to bird watch? Yeah, we love to go to Sandy Ridge in North Ridgeville. It's, I mean, there's all kinds of exotic birds there that just are flying around. But watch the birds in light of this passage and uh, learn some things from the birds. Uh, if you think about, if you're looking up, you know, you're looking up for, at birds, what are you not doing? Where are you not looking? In, you're not focused on yourself. So Jesus says, behold the fowls of the air. And again, learn some lessons from them it says, your heavenly Father feedeth them. Let that sink in. We have, as believers, a heavenly Father. 
that loves us, that cares for us, that's going to take care of us, that's going to meet all of our needs. He promises to in his word. I remember as a young child, I had a good father, even when he was not saved. And I didn't worry about anything. I never worried about the next meal. I never worried about where I was going to sleep. I don't know how everyone's life was like that. Because my dad had it. He went to work. He worked hard. He took care of us. Our Heavenly Father does the exact same, but so much better. And then as you're looking at the birds and learning a few things from them, notice the end of that verse there. Again, something to dwell on, something to think on. The creator of everything, all animals, who cares for the birds, feeds them where they don't have to worry about anything. Jesus says, are you not much better than they? Are you not much better than they? Jesus saying, hey, you are so valuable. That's how he thinks of us. We are so valuable. He cares for us as a heavenly father. And those truths and all the others that have been shared here by, by you all tonight help us in the midst of our anxiety. We can be careful for nothing. And we can take those to the Lord and cast those cares upon him because he cares for us. Amen. Father, teach us through your word. Lord, help us to be bright lights for you of how we can live out your word as those who are not overwhelmed by the sinfulness of this world, the cares of this world, the troubles of this world, that we can be um, beacons of hope and ones who open our mouths to share the truth of those that are struggling. And Father, if there's someone here tonight that truly is struggling, may you help them to know that you're here, that you are near, that you want to commune with them, pour your peace out upon them, Show them your contentment. Lord, help them to realize that uh, you're holding their hand and you're right there with them. Father, we love you. Ask your blessing now on these closing moments of our prayer time. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right. Everybody have a prayer sheet? Raise your hand if you need a prayer sheet. Harold will get one in your hand there. Jim and Lori Mayles are church planners that are our missionary of the week. They're starting a new church in southwest Ohio. And so that's just beginning. They have a place to meet now. They have special services going on. So pray for them. Uh, pray for Tony Ragazzino, our family of the week, the Grace Place Bookstore, uh, Pastor Dennis White, Grace Baptist Church in North Ridgeville, just a few miles down the road there. Uh, pray for them. That's a church of the week. Uh, you may have seen in here that... Uh, our dear sister in Christ, Joan Mitchell, uh, graduated to heaven on Monday, Labor Day. Her daughter had taken her to New Jersey, if you recall, and now she's with her Lord. So pray for that family as they, as they mourn the loss of Joan. And uh, praise the Lord, she was a, a strong believer and a good, a good testimony, but just to continue to lift them up. Uh, Pat Nowak's mom, as we heard on Sunday, recovered from initial covid but then fell, uh, broke some bones, had to have surgery, and then got COVID again, and then wasn't eating well. Pat told me this evening that she's doing better there, uh, eating-wise. I saw an update yesterday about the Vargas. Uh, they continue to very slowly get better, uh, but still Patty's dealing with a lot of pain, uh, but seems to have times where it's not as bad, but when it does happen, it's just excruciating. So continue to, to pray for them. Uh, pray for Tom Keen, that is uh, the father of Sean Sheridan. He was having some recent stomach issues, and uh, as he went in to have those looked at, they found a tumor. Uh, they did surgery today, which apparently was successful, and removed all of that tumor. They're still trying to determine exactly uh, if it was cancerous and what other forms of treatment may be required. But pray for Tom Keen. Sean says he is a believer, so we rejoice in that. But uh, Obviously, that's, that's a pretty big ordeal to have thrust upon you so quickly. All right, others, other prayer requests that we want to add to our, our prayer sheet. Joan. Dean is in the hospital. Okay. 
So we prayed about her in Sunday school on Sunday about that issue, but it's continued to progress. So Dina Zupik is in the hospital, congestive heart failure, which is a condition she's had for quite some time, but it's uh, progressively getting worse, getting worse. Anybody else? Yes. Oh my. How far along is she, Tanisha? 22. 22 weeks. So pray for Don. 22 weeks pregnant. Had to go in the hospital. Baby has a, a very excessive heart rate and uh, having a hard time getting that down. Harold. What did you say his first name was? Alex. Alex, okay. Alex Belisle? Yes. All right, cancer has returned. All right, anybody else? Yes, Nancy. Is that scheduled now? Yes. Joan has an upcoming surgery here within a little over a week. Pray for her knee surgery. Continue to pray for Randy Kelly, Sandy, Pastor Bill. Pray for Shannon and the family while they're away. Praise the Lord, both parents are nearby. That's a huge help. Yeah, Larry still has a bad cough. I talked to him today. He, he sounds good, but he just, he says three words and he starts coughing. And he says three more words and starts coughing. And, and so uh, he's in good spirits, but just not feeling well enough to come back out. Yeah, so pray for Larry and Joyce. All right, if that's it, Harold, would you lead us in prayer for several of these and then dismiss our service?
Amen. Remember the, uh, if you've not got it on your calendar yet, the potluck after our service on the 18th. And I forgot to get the sign-up sheet, so there'll be one up Sunday. So please uh, sign up on Sunday if you plan on coming to that so that we uh, make sure we've got enough of everything that's needed. And with that, have a great rest of the week and good night and God bless you.